Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean, and we are continuing our series in the book of First Timothy. So I usually send it out just via email to the members in the church. And if you do not have it, they can just kind of forward that on to you. And yeah, so we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 6, if you guys are just turning in your Bible. And this is going to be our last sermon of 1 Timothy. Um, you know, nicknames can say a lot about people. Yes. I'm not talking about, you know, we just call Timoteo, Timo, or Doug, Douglas, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, but I'm talking about when you have a real nickname. I know one of my first nicknames I had throughout high school was Sunshine. If you've ever seen the movie uh, Remember the Titans, yeah, you might know why. Uh, if you've seen my photos when, like, whatever, eight years ago, I used to have long, yeah. gold, just beautiful hair. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, people didn't really like it. Uh, I never really watched it. But, uh, yeah, so they called me Sunshine back then. Before that, I actually had another nickname. When I was a little kid, I grew up on like rap and hip hop, and I tried to get my own like like little rap name. Um, I wasn't very creative though. You know, everyone had little John, little this. I came up with Littlefoot because uh, I love Land Before Time. If you've ever seen that, oh, yeah. and so for some reason that influenced me. I was Littlefoot for a couple of years there. But even God's nicknames say a lot about him, right? You know, we can say God, Dad, Father, but God is known by a lot of different names. Savior, the Redeemer, the Judge, Jehovah, the Almighty, Bread of Life, Everlasting Father. One of the names that I really love about God that says a lot about Him, actually, is the Author of Life. That He Himself, He has written your life. But that, that puts almost a, a question on ourselves. Have you ever felt like you were living out the first draft? <laughs> yeah. Like, God, I'm pretty sure you, you, you written my life, and I'm pretty sure you got to make some revisions here, God. <laughs> you know, he hands you the paper, you hand it back to him, circle some things, underline this. God, I don't know if I want this in my life. But because, you know, have you ever felt that you were just bad at this thing called life? You know, the internet doesn't really help you in your confidence either. <laughs> have you ever just, like, Googled how to do anything? And you realize you're not doing anything correct. It could be even something so small as like tying your shoes. There will be like some 10 minute tutorial on teaching you how you're not doing it right. You know, the, the internet is full of these things. But, you know, do not worry my fellow and lost and confused friends. Um, we're going to look through a couple different scriptures about how to have a good life. And 1 Timothy chapter 6 is really full of this, that in the beginning of this lesson, excuse me, in the beginning of the, the book of Timothy, we've been talking about how Paul has been talking to Timothy about how to lead multiple uh, congregations in Ephesus. But here we're going to actually zone in where Paul is now just talking to Timothy. He's just talking to him as a young man, as a, as a young man that Paul's trying to raise up and say, hey, this is what you need to do. As you are leading the church. And so my title for my lesson this morning is Flee, Fight, and Be Faithful. We're going to look through a couple of scriptures where Paul is writing specifically to Timothy on how to have a good life. Point number one is flee and pursue. So we're going to skip down to verse 11 in the beginning. We're kind of going to work our way a little bit back up to what Timothy, uh, excuse me, Paul's talking to Timothy says here in just verse 11, But you, man of God, flee from all this, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Now, what is all this that he's telling him to flee from? Well, previously, you can kind of see in the chapter, that his main thing that he was teaching, specifically that Timothy was going to have to go and teach the congregation, is flee from, first, the love of money, and false doctrine. And I actually kind of preached a similar lesson like this, actually, previously in Sydney. And I kind of did like this little demonstration. I pretended to run off the stage and be afraid that someone was breaking in and maybe mash. I don't know. I was just trying to see what would happen. And uh, that didn't really go that well. Uh, people really did freak out and everything. But my main thing was I was trying to put in, hey, are you running away from sin as fast as you're running away to like save your life? I was trying to remember, like, when is the time that I really ran as fast as I could? And I couldn't think of any examples other than when I was a kid and I was just doing stupid things. 
and running away from consequences. I know that there was a time, probably the fastest that I ran. Um, me and my brother, Eric, some of you guys know him, it was broad daylight. And in America, they have what they call like these ice cream men, these ice cream trucks. And they kind of go down and pretty much, um, you know, right when you hear the music going down, you run as fast as you can to get there. But that wasn't the thing that I ran the fastest for. Um, me and my brother, we kept, we only had like two dollars. And they didn't show the prices on, on like the ice cream display. And so for about like 10 minutes, we keep asking him how much everything costs. <laughs> and he gets frustrated and mad and he like drives away. Um, my brother grabs a rock and throws it and hits the truck. <laughs> and uh, this truck starts chasing us for like 10 minutes. We're running around, we're hiding behind cars. We jump over different uh, people's backyards and everything. And we just hide in the house for like the rest of the day. We're super scared. Um, but, you know, I, I, we were running as fast as we can. Now, that may not be a great example of how to run from your sin. But, you know, you, you have to ask yourself, do you run away from your sin as fast as you run away from the consequences? How fast are you really trying to run away from the sin in your life? You know, maybe your sin is different than the love of money or false doctrine, but sin still messes us up all equally. The Bible actually instructs us in this, talking to the church in Ephesus that Paul's writing as well, in Ephesus 5.3. But among you, there must not even be a hint. Meaning, meaning like a clue, like evidence of sexual morality or of any kind of impurity, of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. That Paul's writing here is like, don't even play with it. Don't, don't even have a little bit in your life. Just, just run away from it. And so he talks to Timothy about, specifically in his life, he needs to run away from two things. And the first one was a love of money, and we would understand that today as greed. Because greed, it's a disease. You know, who is, who, excuse me, he who is not content with what he has will never be content with what he wants. I would think that Paul, even on his heart, when he's writing this letter, I can think of him even just kind of rem reminiscing about the people and the brothers and sisters that may have left the church because of greed. Because there was things that they were unwilling to let go of. And maybe it wasn't even just a greed of money. Maybe it was a dream. Maybe it was an accomplishment. Maybe it was a, a path that they wanted to go and they couldn't let it go. You know, us being here in New Zealand, we actually have a kind of great quote unquote, like an example from here. You guys have all seen the, the movies Lord of the Rings, right? You know, that Smeagol. What's the one thing that we all know that he says? My With about like 10 different S's at the end, right? <laughs> but but what, what, what's crazy about it, it, it showed kind of this depiction of this guy who used to be a hobbit, but not only did it just change his relationships when he had something that he was unwilling to let go of, you would actually just see throughout the movies that it changes his like body composure. He starts looking different. He starts acting different. He actually starts, you know, pushing people outside of his life. And this almost puts on our hearts. You can see when someone doesn't want to give something up. You can notice it right away. Because greed is a cage you tell yourself that you need. But I really love to be a part of this church stuff. Because coming on the mission team here, we, uh, I know I, I arrived a little bit later, but we came here and most people in the church when I arrived were like just trying to find a job, you know? And, but the awesome thing about that is even during that time while everyone was still trying to find a job, because we're a new church and we had to, you know, help the church be self-running, um, we we're still called to give like $100 each week while people did not have a job. And the thing is, is that most people, everyone did it. And it was awesome. And I really wanted to lift the church up for that. And it wasn't something like I came in and said, that, hey, this is what we have to do, or this is how much we have to give. I don't think I really had a conversation with anybody of that. So you ask me why? I don't really know why you guys did that. But I can tell you a promise that you will fulfill. In 1 Timothy 6, 18 through 19, it says here, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they'll lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of a life that is truly life. 
You know, I, I love being part of this church because of how people are just so generous. And again, I don't know why you guys do it, but I just want to help pat you on the back a little bit and say this is at least what you are in laying in store for yourselves in the coming age. And it's awesome because not only do we do this here in Auckland, but even in Sydney and around the world, they're doing these things. You know, actually, here in the church, if you guys may or have not known if you're visiting, um, there's a couple people in the church that are running kind of like a half marathon up and down Mount Eden um, to just raise money to help the church be self-sustaining as well as to send missionaries to Samoa. But also, we kind of stole this idea from Sydney. So Sydney had did this the previous year, but they also did this this year as well. But what's so awesome is that we can kind of build our faith. They had 19 runners, and they raised $20,000. Wow. $20,000 to help plant a church in China later on this year in the beginning of next year. And that's awesome because that's what we can do here as well. We think, oh, well, hey, you know, what can we do? There's only five people running or whatever. But guys, we got to have faith. Because yeah. this money is going for a good cause. So, so the beginning, he's saying, hey, run away from me. Greed. Don't have anything in your life that you're unwilling to let go of for Christ. Then he talks about, again, the next thing that he was instructing Timothy to preach to the, to the congregation. He's saying, hey, run away from false doctrine. You think about it in many areas of our lives. People have tolerated lies for a, a, a lot, right? In, in different areas of our lives, we tolerate lies. Lies, sorry. But especially when it comes to spirituality or to church or doctrine. I think that's the number one where people can tolerate lies. Because it's just, oh, well, well, if... If we're all just kind of going to the same church, we're all just kind of heading the same path. No, it's almost like, run away from it. You know, where, where are other places in our lives where we accept so many lies? Think if you went to the hospital and the doctor was lying and handing out the wrong medication. Would we say, oh, well, all medicine's for good health, right? No, we, we would throw them in jail. In the same way, he's like, you've got to take this seriously. Run away from false doctrine. It's scary to see that people will accept lies as long as it gives them comfort. And Paul's just teaching him, you got to stay away from false doctrine and hold on to truth. Why do people not want to run away from false doctrine? Well, people have different reasons, I guess. Mainly because someone that they love is associated with that doctrine. Mainly because they've done it for too long and it's hard to turn away from it. But there's a cool scripture here that I really connect with in Job chapter 36, verse 21. And it talks about how much we really need to see our repentance and see it seriously. Job 36, 21, it says, Beware of turning to evil, which you seem to prefer to affliction. What this means is like people would rather turn to evil than to pain. Sin is so much easier than repentance. That actually to turn away from false doctrine, to face the truth in the Bible and in your life, well, that's so much harder than just like, oh, well, all the churches are correct. That's so easy. But Timothy, or excuse me, Paul is telling him, hey, you got to turn away from this and keep everybody in your congregation addicted to the truth here. You know, when it talks about these two things, when we have the greed and the, the false doctrine and to run away from these things, um, it actually gets me thinking about a story. So there was a story that has been told of this mental hospital that many years ago um, had this unusual kind of test to determine if the patients there were ready to leave the hospital. So they brought a candidate that was ready uh, for release into a room where a water faucet was turned on. The, the uh, kind of faucet or the, the sink, excuse me, was kind of plugged up and the water would be kind of overflowing onto the ground. And what they would do is they would bring the cannon into the room and they would hand them a mop and a bucket. And they'd say, okay, start mopping. So if the candidate had enough sense to turn off the faucet before they started mopping, they would get released. But most of the time, the candidates would go in there, the patients would go in there, and they would start mopping without ever turning off the faucet. And so they would realize, okay, they're not ready yet to face the real world. And 
what this actually kind of helped me think about is sometimes as Christians, we are facing a world in which we live that we're always confronted with the need to do battle with the evil that dominates this world. But like the patients in the mental hospital, unless we realize where the source of evil is, we will make no real contribution to the damage. So to see less evil in the world means we need to conquer the evil that is pouring forth from our own hearts. And that's what conversion really is, guys. It is to deal first with the evil in us, then to deal with the surrounding evil around us. And we need to use the mop and the bucket, and that's what we would kind of consider like the spiritual armor that God is giving us. But all of these things are just to say simply that with these running away from things, we have to face what's in our hearts. Yeah. We can't say, okay, I'll just do it out in the world and just try to mop it up without ever really changing our own hearts. Mm -hmm. That's what I love by the end of this letter. Paul's not just saying, okay, teach this, teach this, teach this. He, he turns to Timothy and says, bro, you got to do this as well. Mm -hmm. Timothy, you got to face your own heart now. You can go out and teach everything I told you, but Timothy, you need to run away from these things. See, sometimes we can blame other things rather than just facing our own sin. You know, I remember I recently talked to somebody who tried to convince me that they were okay or content with being unhappy. Like, well, being unhappy, that's just, that's just life, right? Most people are unhappy. I paid no attention to it. I, I would not accept a lie like that. He may have tried to convince himself saying that, but I don't believe it. See, people try to settle for less when they don't believe that they can move on. See, you feel burdened, not because your life is just burdensome. You feel burdened because you have idols in your life. You feel unhappy because you're not repenting. You feel these different things that there's a cause to it. It's not just there. That there's, there's a source. There's a faucet that you have to turn on. People will come and, and, and try to convince you, I'm just confused. I don't know what to do. That's not true. The Bible's right here for you. That we do know what to do. We do know how to repent. It's just harder. But I think this is what's awesome is that He's encouraging him at this point. He's like, just run away from him. Don't, don't try to dig in why you want these things in your life. Don't try to sort out the false doctrine and why you're doing it. Just run. Get out of the room. Go. Have you ever been in a situation where you knew that there was nothing else you had to do but just run? That's what he's saying. When it deals with sin and things like this, just, just go. Don't psychoanalyze yourself. Just run, Timothy. He says, what do we have to do? Where do we run them? Where do I go from here? He says, pursue righteousness. Pursue it as though you're seeking it first in your life. Mm -hmm. Do the right things above what you just want to do. Pursue godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Have an aim for your life. See, sometimes the issue is not that we're not running fast enough, but that we're just running in the wrong direction. See, God is more interested in which way that you are running, rather than how fast you are going. Because I've seen it a lot, actually, in the church. Sometimes I've seen leaders kind of come in and be this kind of fire in the pan where they baptize a lot of people, they have awesome sermons and everything, but I don't see them later on. It's not about that. It's like, are you just pursuing God? And I, I, I've talked to some people, like, oh, well, I don't really know how to pursue something, though. I don't know, actually, how to give my whole heart. But what does it really mean to put it in your mind? To fully pursue something means nothing can stop you. You do not have a plan B. There is no other goal than you getting closer to God and you living a life. By the end of your life, God just says, hey, you live righteously. So my point number one is just to kind of see what Paul is talking to Timothy here is, have you stopped seeking God? Are you seeking a good life? Are you seeking comfort? Just go back and start seeking God again. I know that this actually helped change my life maybe about two months ago when I first arrived here in, in um, Auckland. That, as you guys know in the congregation, we usually do Bible studies with people that are coming along. And we have the first study that we do is seeking God. 
And I remember during that study, I actually started thinking to myself, one question he asked people was like, hey, from a scale to zero to 10, how often or how much are you seeking God? Mm -hmm. And for a moment, I just questioned, like, when's the last time I asked myself that? Mm -hmm. Come on. And it, just, it, it, it paused me. I was like, four. Wow. I'm giving myself a four. I was like, huh? I go to church, I preach, I do these things, but I was like, I'm not there. And it helped really change my heart to see where I was. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you guys, maybe, maybe even those that are in the congregation, give yourself a one to ten. Where are you? Where do you see yourself? If you're anywhere below than where you want to be, maybe just do seeking God with yourself again. Mm -hmm. Get it all about just seek God. So we got to flee and pursue. Point number two, fight and break through. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We'll just pause there. So it says here in the beginning of it, in, in the beginning of the chapter, that the love of money is evil. But he ends it off with saying the fight of faith is good. Love of money is evil. But the fight for your faith is a good fight. It's a good fight. It's a good thing you are doing. It's a worthy fight. But it is a fight that many rarely see to the end. But we do need to know who we are fighting. In Ephesians 6, again, talking to the Ephesians church in verse 12, it says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the... Uh, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in this heavenly realm. It says here that you know, what you are really fighting is not just a sin inside, but it is Satan. Satan is our enemy. And what are we fighting over? It says we're fighting for faith. We're fighting for the truth. You know, think about what Satan is trying to take from you. Actually, in Mark chapter 4, uh, Jesus, when he's telling this parable of the seeds, he talks about what Satan really is going after. What is his target in your heart? It says verse 14 through 15. Some people are like seeds along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. See, he wants to take the truth from you. He wants to take the, the, the power of the scriptures away from your heart as soon as it enters. I know that there is a saying that says the largest or the, the biggest hoax in the world that has ever been pulled on the world is that God is not real. That's, that's the biggest lie there. But how does he get people to doubt? How does he get people to take it out sometimes or even hand it over and forfeit it? I think there's kind of three different ways. Obviously there's more, but I think when unloving convince you that you're not good enough or persecution. What I mean by unloving is when Satan can get in your mind that someone is unloving in the church, he has you. You've heard it a lot where you may have talked to somebody and they said, oh, I've had a bad experience in my previous church, so I can't do it. But that's kind of like blaming the hospital for the sick. Right? I, I don't go to the hospital because there's all the sick people there. But where do you expect them to go? <laughs> right? Well, the church is full of hypocrites. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's why we're here. You know? If uh, your friends are hypocrites, bring them along. We, we have room for more. So, so like when people start blaming God for the people in the church, they don't really understand why we're here. Yeah. We're not here because we're perfect. We're here because we're imperfect and we're trying to, to, to seek a perfect God. Come on. So that's how I'm saying can get in there. Well, the people that you're going, they don't really love you. They don't really, he's trying to twist your hearts. The second thing is saying that you're not good enough. But this is where we actually have to have a level of maturity. Yeah. Because has anyone ever sometimes told you that you can't achieve something in your life the way that you're acting? If, if, if you have a goal but you keep acting the way that you're acting, you're not going to achieve it. Mm -hmm. See, that, that's actually an okay statement. Mm -hmm. But instead of getting inspired to change, we get down and say we can't do it. Mm -hmm. See, actually, somewhat, God and Satan kind of tell us the same thing. But tell us different results. Satan will go and say, hey, you're a sinner. 
You, 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 you're imperfect. God doesn't deserve you. You don't deserve God. You should just leave. God actually says somewhat the same thing. Hey, you're a sinner. You're imperfect. Hey, you actually don't deserve my grace. But I want you to stay. And I love you and I think you can do it. They're saying the same thing, but they want different things from you. Who are you listening to more? God or Satan in your life? And persecution. When other people outside are trying to influence you on your decisions for Christ. To be honest, I remember there was a time I really loved persecution. It, it was great because this guy came up to me. And um, I can't remember what he was saying. Actually, he had some weird doctrine that I never really heard of. Um, and to be honest, I was kind of out of my depth. I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. And so I was just kind of sitting there soaking it all in and stuff. And he kind of just turned to me and he was like, well... Man, if I believed what you believe, um, not many people would be doing it. Like, why, why, why do you believe that? Like, I don't see many people doing it. And I was just like, okay, well, I guess that's true. But at least for the church that I'm in now, um, we're doing our best. And we've grown from 12 to 60 now in the past three years. And um, how has your church grown? He's like, oh, uh, yeah, we haven't grown in like five years. I was like, well, actually, the truth is growing more than your false doctrine. And he, he was taken back from it a bit. He was like, that is true. And he actually saw that we were doing something with our lives, and he wasn't. And it wasn't obviously a, a competition or anything like that. But I, I was just glad to say, like, actually, it is working. People may look at, well, not many people are believing, and that's why we go and share our faith. But Satan, again, is trying to twist our hearts with that. See, it says here that we have to fight. And we have to fight to hold, uh, excuse me, we have to fight with everything we have to hold on to what we have. But even more than that, we are having to fight to hold on to these things. But the power of our strength and our salvation is not us holding on to God. The power of our salvation is that God is holding on to us. See, God is holding on to you harder than you are holding on to your sin. God is holding on to you harder than you're holding on to this unhappiness or this, this something, this thing in your heart. God won't let go of it. God is stronger than us. See, we may have not always stuck with him, but he is always sticking with us. See, in this all, when we're fighting for our faith, is when we have to say we're holding on to it, realize God is holding on to us. But even more than that, it's fighting for the faith of the people around us. See, Satan has really studied us, and he's coordinating a plan to really poison us in, in, with doubt. But the main thing that he wants us to do is he wants not just to stop you, but he wants to slow you down as well. See, in Acts 4, 18, it says this. Then he called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. This is just a snippet of a scripture talking about how when the disciples were persecuted, they got taken in, they got prisoned, they got flogged and everything. But their command here was not stop believing in God. Was not, hey, I want you to de denounce your faith. The only simple thing was just stop talking about it. See, what's music to Satan's ears is silence. He loves it when he just hears people not talking about our faith. See, the fight is not only for ourselves, but for the people around us. Because the world is too silent now. And when you read in the scriptures, there is a desperation to get the world out. Yeah. But where's all the fasting today? Mm -hmm. Where's all the, 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 the anguish, the urgency to go and preach the word, the weeping? The waking up in the middle of the night and saying, I, I gotta go out and preach the word. But now people are listening to seminars of just being more brave and being courageous. It's not really about that, guys. It's about fighting for the faith of others. See, we're not just fighting for ourselves, but we're fighting for our family, fighting for our spouses, we're fighting for our friends, our cousins. I know how many cousins you guys have out here in the islands. <laughs> There's a lot to fight for. Yeah. But to remember at the end of it, guys, that, that the fight is a good fight. Yeah. It's a worthy fight. That you got to turn to the people to your left and to your right and say, hey, you're worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. 
You've got to look in the mirror in yourself and just say, hey, you're, you're worth fighting for. To the people that, that haven't really understood, like, hey, you're worth fighting for. So what are our weapons to fight Satan? I think there's three different weapons. We're going to look at first our weapon of prayer. Come on, Sean. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, it says, Rejoice always, pray continuously, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I love when the Bible just simplifies things that we can kind of make very complicated. You know, have you ever just got into a conversation where it's like, I don't know what the will for my life is. I think you would probably upset him if you just read the scripture. <laughs> oh, what should I be doing? Where should I move? Just pray. No, 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 give me more. <laughs> But, but this is an awesome thing. Just, just pray continuously. Just be happy wherever God has you in your life. Come on, John. And so this, is our, this, should, this should be our, our tool that we use to fight God, uh, excuse me, Satan with. That it kind of puts in our hearts is, is prayer your steering wheel or is it your spare tire? Do you simply just go to it when you run into a rut? No, we got to be continuously praying. Because you can never outrun a bad prayer life. You can't. You can come to church and read the Bible. You can do everything else. But if you're not just simply praying to God, your heart won't be there. So, the first thing we have to do is pray. I think the second weapon is fasting. You know, there are certain things that the Bible calls us to do that sometimes we don't quite understand, but it works. I think praying and fasting are those two things. Where when you fast, you start really just to focus on God. Yeah. I know literally we just fasted on Friday. And I forgot about like 10 times that we were fasting. Because <laughs> um, I was at home and uh, like, you know, every time you're hungry, you just kind of go to the fridge and see what's in there. Um, I didn't go grocery shopping yet, so there's nothing in there anyways. But uh, like 10 times that day, I'll open it up. I'm like, hey, what is there to eat? Oh, I'm fasting. I'll close it. And I know that in the scripture it says you have to fast and pray. So I'll say a little prayer. And I did that like literally 10 times. I kept forgetting that I, uh, we were fasting. But it, it, it's awesome. When you just fast, there's a focus on God. Yeah. They say that the greatest enemy of hunger for God is not doubt, but apple pie. It's when you're simply just getting other desires of the flesh rather than just doubt or the deep things. Just sometimes you just got to get all of everything else and just focus on God. And the last one is the weapons of the word. You know, have you ever judged someone on how they can do based on how old they are? Where you saw someone is like, hey, they're a little bit too young for that role. They're too old for that role. Well, success is not based on how many years you have spent in the world. It's how long you have spent in the word. That's where you get success in life. That with fighting, you have to fight with prayer, with fasting, and with the word. And when we do, just remembering that people around us, we are fighting for. So point number three, and coming up to a close here in the uh, book of Timothy, it's be faithful and come through. So ending it off in verse 13 through 16, it says, In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and for Christ Jesus, who will testify before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and most, and the only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom, had, uh, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. What a way to end the letter. I wish I could end my sermon today like that, but we'll see what happens. But, um, you know, he, he starts this off, and he says previously, in, in the previous point about how we made our good confession, and we have to hold on to that, but he brings it back down to Jesus. And he says, Jesus made his good confession before you. Before Pilate, Jesus made his confession. That he was going to die for our sins and not save. He kept his confession through the pain of the will. He kept his con confession as, uh, excuse me, he kept his confession as 
through with those while he was dying and he was being spat on the face. He kept his confession when we turned to our sin for the first time. He kept his confession during that time in your life when you completely turned away from God. And he's saying he keeps his confession now. I guess that puts on our hearts, are you keeping yours? Is Jesus still the Lord of your life? Or have you mistakenly thought that this was a conditional confession? When you said it before your baptism. Hey, Jesus is Lord. That's not, that's not a moment thing. That's, that's a forever thing. Yeah. Come on. See, Jesus made his good confession before we did. That, that should give us our hearts like He's still holding it. Are we still going to hold ours? See, it says here in Hebrews 4, talking about Jesus and everything that he had to go through. 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It says Jesus has faced everything and has been through everything, and he came through. And we can too, because we are approaching his throne, which is full of grace. See, he doesn't want us just to be perfect. It's different. It's kind of like this. When I married my wife, Tegan, I didn't make the vow to be a perfect husband, but you can never question my commitment. It's the same thing. When we're making a vow to God, I'm never going to be a perfect son, but you can never question my commitment. That's how we have to see our confession. Is God, hey, I'm, I'm going to live and die with you through it all the thick and thick, but you never question if I'm there for you. Come on, John. I may go off on different paths, but God, I'm always going to come. See, in the end of this all, guys, is, you know, I think the last challenge he's putting here on Timothy is like, hey, yes, you're going to go out and teach everybody. Yes, you're going to have to help out the churches. But Timothy, I just want to talk to you and how you have a good life. Mm -hmm. Timothy, just, just flee from this. Timothy, pursue God. Continue to do that. Don't pursue just a good church and success there. Just, just pursue God to Timothy, you know, you gotta, you gotta fight. You're, you're gonna be in this church and everything. You gotta fight not only for everyone around you, but fight for yourself as well. Timothy, no matter what happens, that Paul would have felt this in his life as well, as that many would have left him. He says, it doesn't matter. You keep the confession as God is keeping it with you. See, life, at the end of it, isn't all that hard, actually. All you have to do is run faster than your temptations. Fight harder and longer than your enemy, and keep the faith. You know, I may actually never know how to really tie my shoes super effectively like the internet's going to tell me. <laughs> I may never have all the wrinkles out of my shirt. But I think we can do that, guys. We can hold on to these things and approach God's throne of grace and keep the faith. And I think you can too. Thank you guys very much.